Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome marketers, advertisers, and those who love them to Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, the decisions, and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former Chief Marketing Officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here today with my guest, Paul Madeira. Paul is a very different guest for this show, having founded and grown a successful venture capital firm called Meritech out here in Silicon Valley. Meritech is one of the first firms, or maybe the first firm, to do later stage investing, And Paul has backed some serious winners, including Facebook, Salesforce, Roblox, and Snowflake. Previously, Paul flew F-16s for the Air Force and was an investment banker. So all of his friends, including me, are waiting for him to to accomplish something that we can be proud of for him. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Mike. It's uh, let me just say it's a real pleasure that you have me on your podcast, mainly because I could never have made it as a real marketeer. I I don't have the men- mental agility. I don't have the comm skills, but uh, uh, but I really mean that. And and let me also say I I I I guess you're scraping the bottom of the barrel these days since you have to have the likes of me on. Yeah. Well, we'll let our listeners decide on that, Paul. Today's topic is what do venture capitalists really think about marketing? And the hint I'm going to give you in advance is sometimes they don't think about it at all. And here's the setup. Paul has lived in Silicon Valley for many years, looked at thousands of potential investments and invested in, I think, less than what 100 or 200 companies. He has relationships with many CEOs and CFOs and some CMOs. And he's always on the lookout for businesses that can scale at above normal rates. That may sound to many of you like marketing, but my experience is that it can be a number of things. Paul, how about starting out by giving our listeners an overview of venture capital? Certainly. So at the highest level, let me compare VC with private equity. So the large and the mid-market buyout firms that we all recognize the Blackstones, the Clayton Dubalier, Carlisle, and so forth, that sector of finance is much larger than venture capital, maybe 5x the size in terms of personnel, in terms of capital under management, and so forth. PE buys industries or major companies, typically in mature or slower growing industries, and they look for efficiencies or to create efficiencies, nudge growth and EBITDA by a few single digits or so. We in venture capital are much more on the early side. We invest smaller amounts and we're more advisors. We don't own these companies. We don't have majority ownership. We look for companies that may be from zero all the way up to 200 million in revenue. They may be growing two to three X in their early years, slowing to 40% ish or so as they approach hundred million in revenue. And, um, And uh, we are going into companies that have significantly more risk, lots of losses relative to PE, but then uh, it's countered by several outsized performers to produce a reasonable fund return uh, in venture capital uh, individual groups. We at Meritech here are more focused on later stage in uh, venture investing, which I would define as kind of 10 million in revenue and up, and it's different from early stage in that they're investing in companies that are at zero or 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 just a little bit of revenue, and uh, they're looking for significant outsized returns in a narrow set of their companies. We at the late stage uh, have fewer 10x's, so we can't afford as many losses as the early stage investors. Hey, so Paul, of of all your portfolio, how many companies actually make it? to an event for you where you get you you actually get a return for your investors. I, I mean oh. I know you, you I know you have fundraisers, I mean fund makers like Salesforce or, or Roblox where they just blow up the entire fund and and you have had a, quite a good track record making the uh Forbes Midas list quite a number of times. Uh how many how many of your companies make it through? 
You know, um, so I would say less than 10% we lose our money because even in late stage, it's risky. And then a good percentage, 20, 30%, we might get a return on the invested capital, meaning we just get our bait back. And then we make more than 1x on the remaining amount. Um, we at Meritech have been fortunate. We've had a number of outsized returns that kind of boost the, boost the funds overall. But um, I think in terms of distributions that the losses and the return of capital were probably fairly typical amongst later stage. Nice. Thank you. Hey, so so you've, you've told us that uh, venture capital is all about growth and later stage venture capital. I, I think that would be like C round, maybe B round or surely D&E. Um, tell us how you pick which companies to invest in. It, do you look at the brand? Do you look at the pricing analytics? What is it that makes you pick a company? And then we're going to turn this on to, all right, let's talk about how marketing plays into this. But first, Tell us how you pick these companies. Sure. Yeah. Well, over the last 25 years I've been doing this, yeah, the industry has changed dramatically. So back in the late 90s when I started, and I think that's about the same time you retired, wasn't it? Uh, that's that's um, really cute. So, cute. Very cute. Yeah. Uh, VC, was, VC was quite narrow. Just uh, for our just, listeners, we're the exact same age, but one of us looks younger and it is not Paul. Thank you. So uh, go ahead, please. So back then... VC was pretty narrow and funds were a lot smaller and 100 million or so was a large VC fund. Today, you know, five, 600, 700 would be relative. So it's grown significantly in the last 25 years. So at that time though, at, back in the late nineties, the investable universe really consisted of communications and data infrastructure, ethernet switching boxes, optical transmission devices, wireless infrastructure, all that stuff is fairly commoditized today. We didn't, interestingly, we didn't invest in software because there was this big software company called Microsoft who went after any new promising software company and killed it. So no VC wanted to uh, throw money away going after software companies. So fast forward to today, VC is so much broader. We cover everything related to the internet, all the apps on your phone, your new electric cars, next generation of uh, electric aircraft and spacecraft, new ways of running accounts, making payments and the like. Um, so, so that's the focus, that very broad focus today. We at Meritech would specialize more in B2B software these days. Now we do everything across tech, but most of what we're seeing and doing is B2B uh, software. Um, so, so tell me now, I, that is a really great overview of, of the industry. I, I, hopefully there's a whole bunch of marketers and ad agency folks listening to this. Tell me how you think about marketing and you know, brand building and all of that cool stuff that marketers do when you are looking at these companies, both in B2B and B2C. Sure. So um, we do care a lot about what we call marketing, but it's a different function than what most of our listeners here are familiar with. Let me break companies down perhaps into two categories because the marketing needs and the way we investors think about it are pretty different. So we think of at least for earlier stage companies, and by this I mean companies that are up to 50 million or so in run rate. And we think of marketing and that for those younger companies as focused on demand generators and guerrilla marketing. For companies over 50 million in runway, we do see a shift to kind of a, a broader brand building PR oriented. Uh, by the way, it is the view amongst my view and maybe many of my peers that few CMOs can do both those kinds of marketing at the same time. One tends to be really good at one or the other of those two. So, uh, so the reason why companies, you know, call uh, marketing demand generation and, and and so forth when they're smaller is the need for short term revenue growth. It really is sales momentum is priority number one. It is priority number two. It is absolutely all consuming in a early startup. And, and what that means is they, 
they need to generate real-time sales right now. They don't have the option. They don't have the the opportunity to look longer term and to do the branding things that may matter next year because all they really need are sales leads that turn into sales full stop. They got to show progress or they can't raise their next round. And is it fair to say, is it fair to say that brand building at, at that stage, at that size, is really not that important versus aggregating demand? Oh yeah. Oh, that that's exactly correct. Like the brand, the brand almost doesn't really matter in this case. The brand really doesn't matter in this case. And then did you, is, I, other than, yeah, look, I, I, you had an early stake in Facebook and, and Roblox where the brand, brand clearly mattered, but but that was a brand built off of aggregation first versus marketing. Is that, is that Are those both fair statements? Well, it, it, you sort of hinted at this a little bit earlier. There is a difference between the B2B space where we're specializing in and the B2C space where where the brand actually does matter at an earlier point, in all fairness. For Roblox, for Niantic, who did the Pokemon Go game that we invested in and so forth, you, you know, they did need to do a bigger branding, broader advertising campaign to attract, to attract uh, uh, customers and revenue. For the B2B space, I mean, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is can you get early adopters in your targeted zones? And then can you take the brand names of those customers and use those to to convert new prospects into paying customers? Uh, so that's yeah, I, I have seen a, a huge amount of firms do that, which is we serve these folks. So surely you should buy us. Yes. Uh, got it. Hey, so if if I'm a marketer out there or or uh, or in sales, what should I think about before jo joining an early or later stage startup? Like what, what career advice would you give our listeners when they look at this industry? Because, you know, startup stuff is all the hot thing and gosh, I want to go do it. But it may not be the best place for your career, or I guess it may. Tell us what you would and how you advise people thinking about a career in, in this entrepreneurial startup sure. space. Well, first of all, it's it's really important to assess the uh, or assess the realistic opportunity of that company because so many interesting startups who have grand visions have the right people at them have a wonderful early product they just don't work out and change is really hard. So I I would recommend you talk to investors, you talk to customers, you really assess it carefully. The other thing to recognize is there's very little training in startups. There just isn't the capacity, the time, the bandwidth to provide training for a younger, less experienced marketeer or other functional expert to come on and kind of learn the business. Everyone has to be a contributor at the highest rate when you join a particularly an earlier startup. And so it is not a place to think about going and developing yourself to get really good at uh, at your skill, whether it's marketing or otherwise. So you're not going to get a lot of training, uh, and uh, but also sometimes, ha having lived out here for a while, you will get a lot of uh, founders, in particular, or some people that think the brand really matters. When you're telling me maybe in us, uh, particularly in B two B, it doesn't really matter at all. When does it start to matter if you're a brand person? Because a lot of people say they want the brand, and then when they real the realize the price tag on the brand or how long it's going to take to get it, they don't really want it, but it's too late. The marketer's already in the job. Hey, just talk about that a little bit, will you? That's a really interesting. That's a very good question. And and thank you, I, thank I, you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so so brand starts marketing maybe north of fifty million in terms of. I mean, that's the point where companies can kind of take a deeper breath. They have a little more resource. They have access to more funding. They can start to think about next year as opposed to next quarter. And they're more interested in investing in, in their brand. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one comparison is that it's like selling to the federal government. That is a that is a lost cause for very early companies. Cost too much, takes too long, too unpredictable. Same for brand building for very early companies. After you get larger, you can, you have the capacity and and you have the obligation really to start thinking longer term. And companies need to think about brand building at that point. 
Any good examples of that where you say the, the brand has first an aggregated demand uh, or, uh, you know, and then it, it got to the point where then the brand mattered and it turned on. It, do you have any good examples in your portfolio of that? Uh, yeah. You know, maybe MuleSoft was a great example. I don't know how many of your listeners. You should tell everybody what MuleSoft does. So MuleSoft is um, it's sort of the ultimate software product in the sense that it's a sort of a intermediate layer of software that connects cloud based storage with all of the cloud-based apps. So think about the accounting apps, even your marketing apps and the like that were moving to the cloud a few years back. Well, all of them had different protocols for storing their data. MuleSoft sat in between them and could actually make it much easier to munge together that those different kinds of, of data and go into the cloud and be stored efficiently without a lot of reworking the data. So MuleSoft started out slowly, sold to the largest company, Salesforce was one of their biggest to start with, and then gradually uh, expanded out and then focused on building a brand name and uh, successfully became the standard for controlling a tremendous amount of cloud data. And I recall they went to a lot of industry shows, they did a lot of they did a lot of their own stuff. They didn't do what I'll call technical advertising. I, I thought they went, they built the brand in the B2B community to, the, to their to their group. If I, I may have that wrong, so correct me if I do. Oh, no, they did. Yeah, they they, I mean, they built marketing that way. I also want to call it the use of the word munge, uh, where they munge together all the data, which I guess is a very technical venture capitalist word. Uh, I, next question. So you guys always invest with an investment thesis. If that thesis is going sideways, is marketing the first thing that you look at to go? Uh, I mean, you're because you, you know you got to keep the wheels turning, and because because I want people to know if they go into this kind of job, what's it like? If it if it works, it's really clear. If it kind of works, a little bit clear. If it doesn't work, what happens? Well, as you might imagine. Uh, companies and many are going through this right now. You know, literally, uh, the last couple of years were so tremendously fruitful in fundraising, and that is not the case today in startup land. Um, uh, companies are looking at anything that is not producing direct measurable ROI, and that is producing near term sales, and they're trimming that. And marketing happens to be one of those things that can be a little tougher to measure. Now, if you're doing the strict demand generation, producing sales leads that actually turn into fungible sales, that's great. Uh, but if you're not, if there isn't good measurement available uh, that's hard and believable, it is more likely on the chopping block. Got it. So let's let's drill down on this a little bit because we've just coming off the era of essentially free money, super low interest rates where valuations were completely based on pretty much sales. You see it in a streaming company, you see it in all this stuff. Now you have this rebooting of valuation and you have all these companies that have pretty much scaled back all the long-term brand building work and sometimes even the infrastructure build, build up in a mad dash for sales. What's gonna happen going forward as that, that game changes? Well, what, what really is happening right now is that there's a number of sales and marketing efficiency metrics that have sort of developed over the last 15 years since Salesforce was kind of the first cloud-based uh, software company to appear. I'm talking about this sector because it's the largest in our world. Um, and those, those metrics largely got ignored over the last couple of years and the focus was solely on top line growth. How much were you growing yeah. over quarter, year over year? And if that was good, people were happy to throw money at you at very high valuations for your company. Today, we're going back and we're looking at how efficient has that how how, how efficient has that money been spent? Has it produced real uh, uh, valuable margin and and longer term non churning customers? And uh, we're really digging deep. And where that is not very visible, that is, you have an efficient spend of $1 to produce $3 of gross margin, so to speak, then we're looking at trimming that. Yeah, got it. 
So, so we've got all this stuff going on. We got the revaluation. We also have this AI. You know, everyone is all really revved up about AI. You can't get anything in your newsfeed without AI. Um, so you've got all this stuff going on, and you have tremendous amount of layoffs going on in technology right now, a huge amount. Tell us what's really going on there in your mind. I know everyone will have their own opinion, but you have pretty much a great catbird seat to look at it. What's really going on? Is this tell permanent, temporary? How's it going to shake out? What do you think? It's, it's really kind of temporary. And I say that because what, what really has happened over the last two years when money was free, as you say, and it was widely available and everyone was jumping into the venture capital, which made our life very tough, by the way. Um, they were throwing money at companies and companies decided, hey, money's free. I'll just sort of invest in my team that I need two or three years out. And uh, that's what they did. Only this year, or I should say later 2022 and, and now, it's very clear that they won't be growing at 100%. They may be growing at 50%. And they just don't need all of the people they hired. So they're kind of- a lot of them, a lot of them hired for 200%. They hired for, they, yeah, they hired for massive exactly. growth and, all, and everyone was gonna win, yeah. Yeah, so, so the tech industry is still relatively healthy it just got over its skis in terms of in terms of hiring and expectations. And how about the AI? The, all the all the AI stuff is that going to replace a lot of people in tech and a lot of marketers in tech, and and maybe a lot of salespeople in tech? Because you know AI can now almost do anything. Apparently, tell us what you think about that. <laughs> I think it's really early in the days of AI. There's a there's that we have a long ways to go before it replaces most of us. Um, I mean, we're all fascinated by what ChatGPT is showing us, um, but that's really sort of a, 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 a evolutionary progression over the last several years as compute power has come down, algorithms have been refined and, and like, and we're, we're in the early stages of AI and it's not going to replace us tomorrow, but 10 years from now, it will be certainly much more prevalent, much more capable. And it will probably never replace an F-16 pilot in the near future, I'm just guessing. Um, hey, so uh, is it true that the writers of Silicon Valley stopped by your office for plot lines? It is true. It is okay. true. Yeah, no, uh, a few years back when they were writing their show, they came back a couple of times. One of my partners was close to one of the people on the team, so they came in and uh, it was really kind of fun, but it was interesting from this perspective. If you watch Silicon Valley, I, I can tell you that the interaction, the details, the way that the venture capital world interfaces with tech and so forth was amazingly accurate. I mean, they really <laughs> nailed it. But when we talked to the writers, that they didn't have a clue. I mean, they were just a bunch of guys, a bunch of funny guys who could write great lines. And so they were they were asking the most basic questions as to how, you know, small startups actually work. Um, but somehow they took that information from us and from others and sort of put it together into what was really a compelling series. So it makes it makes everybody either want to work in startup land or <laughs> never want to work in startup land if you haven't watched the show. So so why we're on the kind of whole Silicon Valley thing and the the television show or the, the the show is is there a super funny story you can tell us about uh, venture capital and or marketing or anything you want to share with our listeners? Well, I I, um, I can tell you a story about it. It's not maybe that funny, except on me, and that is that you know I met Mark Zuckerberg back in two thousand and five, and he was literally twenty three years old. Had been out of Harvard for a year. And he just raised money with uh, some of our friends around here, Axel Partners and Peter Te Peter Thiel. And um, it wasn't really a business. It was kind of on 30 college campuses at the time. And I actually got very interested in it because we'd missed out on investing in MySpace. It got bought out from underneath us. And, um, and MySpace was a lot more interesting, much bigger, had a real business model, which Facebook did not have. So we had to go to the next best one. It happened to be Facebook. And I actually got very interested in it because I picked up a local newspaper here in Palo Alto 
and read a story about a young woman who was a freshman over at Berkeley across the bay. And uh, she was talking about how she could no longer make it to class because she would sit in front of her computer on this program called Facebook and read about all of her classmates. And that was much more interesting to her. And I thought, that's the kind of thing I want to invest in. Yes, she's and, probably uh, running a big firm right now. Uh, <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, so as I'm talking to Zuckerberg, it, it, remember, this is 30 college campuses. He starts telling me his vision. He's marketing to me. His vision is that someday Facebook would be the first thing that most of the U.S. would go to in the morning when they turned on their computers. We didn't have we didn't have smartphones then. And it would be the last thing at night they checked before they went to bed. And I remember thinking, that's the most ridiculous thing I have <laughs> ever heard. And but of course, I didn't say that. I nodded. I nodded politely and I said, that's that's fantastic. And that's why we want to invest in you. And of course, today, it, you know, that has largely come true. And you did invest and it did. I, It, it did. Yeah. With full disclosure, Paul and I ride bikes uh, pretty much every weekend. I get a big download on what's going on in VC land. And I, I know that you've had a lot of big wins and Facebook is, is one of them. And I, I want to follow on this whole uh, <laughs> Facebook Mark Zuckerberg discussion and say, even though you were one of the earliest investors in Facebook, my, uh, my looking at your Facebook kind of account says you, you've never actually posted a real update there. Is, is this true? You know what? Actually, I'm, uh, my, uh, you're cutting out on me. I, I can't hear very well. <laughs> Um, so it is true. Yeah. Are, so, are, you, uh, are you pointing out my 10 year old picture as well on that? I am. Um, I am. I am. It, it, it is true. It is true. I actually do not use Facebook on a regular basis, but I certainly see the value in it. And uh, <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> as, as, as I would say to my LPs who may have asked me that question, I would say That's my limited job partners. Yeah. Is to, uh, yes, is to find you good investments, and I will continue doing that. Got it. Well, uh, Paul, we're. we're Cl uh, closing in on the end of, end of the show, but I want to open it up. One piece of practical advice you would give our listeners, uh, like from, from your seat, what would you tell them? You know, I would say um, I'm a huge believer in getting big company training before coming to startups. And I know in the marketing world, uh, big company training can happen a little bit at, 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 when you get your bachelor's degree, a little more when you get your MBA, but the training grounds of P&G and Lever Brothers and the classic uh, big marketing companies are wonderful backgrounds to go learn your craft before trying to come into the startup world. And, and of course, when you do come into the startup world, you'll get to work longer hours, you'll get paid less. <laughs> you, will, you will have more risk in your position and in the company and so forth, but for the right companies, for the right companies, you will succeed beyond anything you will see in a conventional larger company. So come on out. Thank you, Paul. That was super, I think, a great closing comment. And thanks to everyone for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for our other shows on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify, including Is the Obsession with Measurement Destroying the Marketing Function? What it's really like to be a marketer in the B2B startup world why the short shelf life of CMOs parts one and two, and how private equity really thinks about marketing. Hey, all you marketers, stay safe out there. Thank you, Paul. This is Mike Linton signing off for this session of CMO Confidential.